This video is sponsored by Tokyo Treat and Sakura Co. Want a chance to win a trip to Japan while enjoying some Japanese snack boxes? Find out more after the video. I've been asked multiple times to review this movie ever since I reviewed the movie Wolf Walkers, which I did almost two years ago. I didn't know it was that long. Anyway, I think it's finally time that I dip my toe <laughs> into your most suggested film, especially since I see someone in the comments doing the day one of asking Rosmo to review Song of the Sea. So here I am, covering yet another movie from Cartoon Saloon for me to know if you've heard of it and if I'd recommend watching it to those who haven't. Today I'll be talking about the 2014 animated fantasy film Song of the Sea, created by the studio that brought you Wolf Walkers, Cartoon Saloon, directed by Tom Moore. This movie is a co-production among the Republic of Ireland, Belgium, Denmark, France, and Luxembourg. It centers around a story of the lives of a family after they've lost a wife and a mother, and now dealing with a magical daughter with mythical characters inspired from Irish folklore. From this point on, there will be spoilers. You can go ahead and watch the movie to immerse yourself in the story yourself. Now from the posters, I actually thought that the main character would be this little girl, and I expected her to be a rowdy, dream-aspiring girl who takes no rules from no one, like the one in Wolfwalkers. But I was surprised to see that the main character was her big brother. And sure, she is also a main character, but most of the development and character beats are focused on Ben, which subverted my expectations and it is a pleasant surprise considering the story Ben goes through in the movie. So it starts with the pregnant Bronog spending time with her son Ben, singing a song, painting, and telling him stories of Selkies, a magical creature that can turn into a sea lion with the purpose to send all the spirits home with her song. Then out of nowhere, her hair turns white and she apologizes before disappearing. Then we cut to Ben and Sersha. This is how you spell her name! I know. Now Sersha can't speak. She goes to the water innocently, mesmerized by the sea lions, and Ku, their dog, goes to save her, dragging Ben, who seems terrified of water, along with him. The two go to their dad, which only seems to pay attention to Sersha, leaving Ben feeling neglected, and pulls out the only thing bringing him comfort, a conch shell his mother gave him. Grandmama visits, plays Barbie dress up darling on YA.com on Sersha, and then Sersha nabs Ben's conch. Ben gets angry since it is the only piece of remembrance from his mom, but their father seems to dismiss his complaints and call them for Sersha's birthday party. By this point, it's quite apparent how their father, Connor, has changed significantly to the smiling, loving father from the opening sequence. Here, he is devoid of energy, having only enough attention for one child and barely even. Ben being the brat that he is, pushes Sersha's face in her cake and their dad gets mad. And it's at this point where I'm supposed to say kids are annoying, kick them off the ledge, drop them at the pool. But the movie really shows where Ben is coming from and how he must have been feeling so far in the movie. The kid never got attention and is screaming for it, even if that attention is bad. Because after his mom died, he barely got any. Nighttime falls, Sersha steals the conch again, Connor goes drinking at a pub to sink the sadness out, and Sersha plays the first few melodies of Bronog's song, which makes you wonder how she knows it. Because from the flashbacks, it seems that Bronog died of childbirth. She follows the pretty colors and leads her to a chest with a shining white coat that is just her size. <laughs> what a coinky ding. She keeps following the lights and we see a shot of her amazed at what she's looking at sea lions awaiting her at the sea. She walks towards it and we see a shot of her looking in awe. At what, you may ask? Well, here's a shot of the same sea lions we saw earlier. And then she stops and gasps and seemingly amazed at what she's looking at. And what is she looking at, you may ask? Well, here's the same damn shot of the sea lions for the third time. In case you missed it the first few times, you know. Sersha imitates the sound the sea lions make, which is incredibly adorable, I might melt. And also the first time we ever get to hear Sersha's voice. Then she turns into a sea lion, playing around in the ocean. Grandma Mamami senses danger with her spidey senses and brought Sersha back. Connor gets worried and Ben asks him where she got this and Connor replies with, Where did she get this? Give me that. Loving father, everybody. Give it up for the father of the year. Is he even your son? Is there like a plot twist where he's actually not your son? Because I feel the animosity in the air, don't you? Before you go defend Connor in the comments, I'll talk about his character later in the video. For now, we continue to see Grandmama Mommy Mama taking the kids with her and Ben refusing to go because he wants to stay with his dad and Ku, arguing that it's Sersha's fault for this development. And in the eyes of a child, this is unfair. This scene broke my heart. Ben was really trying not to get taken away, crying and begging not to. And what does dear old dad say about it? Oh. Don't make me go! Let me out! Stop it, man! Will you? <laughs> and the poor boy starts crying! Do we get an apology? Nah, <laughs> it's, it's calm! 
Connor! I was hoping to see a little bit of love, a tiny bit of interaction between father and son to show Connor cares, but I got none. I really feel sad for Ben at this point in the movie, and it's just the beginning, folks. And if that wasn't enough to break your heart, his dog runs off barking all over the place as we watch Ben get farther and farther away, having no control over his life. Grandma Mommy Mama tries to comfort Ben by the classic trying to make a kid understand in exactly a way that a kid won't understand the situation. But Ben took the mature route and composed himself and took a deep breath, which hurt me even more because this kid had to suck up all the emotion he just had a few moments ago. They arrived at Grandma's place where they did nothing. They go to bed and Ben tries to escape, but Sersha follows him so he hooks Ku's leash to Sersha while they walk. I don't know where, but he did it. And I really like this scene. Okay, you can keep it for now, but you'd better clean it when we get home. It really shows their children. It shows a bit of character for Sersha who will give back his conch and not claim it to be hers and Ben letting her keep it for now. Which isn't much, but I'd expect a prideful character like Ben to take it snot and all. Just as long as Sersha doesn't have it. But he lets her keep it for a while, which I didn't expect he'd do when I was watching. I like it. It kind of strikes me as they don't hold grudges as most kids don't at a very early age. Stranger danger happens and they bring Sersha to a secondary location. Never a good thing. They sing a song which, correct me if I'm wrong since I'm not Irish and I had to research this, but they sang Dulaman, a traditional Irish song translating to seaweed. I looked up the song and it has very different lyrics except for the chorus from the one sung in the Song of the Sea, at least in the English dub that I watched. In the original, it says, O gentle daughter, here comes the courting men. O gentle mother, put the wheels in motion for me. Which, you know, for Saoirse to be a literal child, the lyrics wouldn't fit the movie. And I think it's just the fairies making up lyrics because they wanted to celebrate finding the selkie. And they sing, The selkie song is bright to awaken all who follow. Mananan, someone known as the son of the sea in Irish folklore, will lead, and Tirnaog will follow. Tirnaog is the home of the fairies where the selkie song will help guide the fairies too. Am I still with you? A lot to process if you don't know Irish folklore, because same. But it's interesting, ain't it? I'm sorry, but watching it without subtitles gave me a hard time understanding this song at first, and I didn't like it. But while making the script and listening to the different covers of Dulaman, it started to grow on me. It's pretty catchy. Then Maka's owls attack, trying to kidnap Sersha, but with the fairies and Ben's help, they escape, having the fairies sacrifice themselves and turn to stone, like the ones around them. In a panic, Sersha blows on the horn, playing a little bit of the song, and it breaks them free from the curse slightly. They ride a bus, Sersha yeets herself out to follow the pretty lights, which led them to a holy well. And honestly, this whole scene to the well is so wholesome. It shows another side of Ben where he isn't trying to ruin Sersha's day or sass her. At the start, he did, but then he saw her hair turning white, which is what he last remembers his mother to have before disappearing. Ben takes action looking after his sister, which is all kinds of sweet and adorable, seeing him carry her so that she wouldn't get pricked by the plants and letting himself get pricked instead, and Sersha getting leaves to soothe his wounds. Then Sersha yeets herself again, but this time in water. Ooh, when will Sersha stop yeeting herself? We will never know. Find out in the next episode of... or in the next few minutes. Ku chases after Sersha again with the leash still intact, meaning Ben will get dragged into the water again without him even being prepared. And I just thought, this kid's gonna die. Uh, how much air did he take before? Oh, <laughs> he's dead. Luckily, he's still alive. He meets the great Sinachai, I don't know if I'm saying that right, that has hair strands with people's memories and finds Sersha being turned to stone. Even if he's scared, he goes to confront Maka. So that answers our question of when Sersha will stop eating herself off of places. The end. Good night, everybody. <laughs> so yeah. I'm kidding. Ben stumbles on Bronog's memories, which, uh, poor boy? Getting traumatized twice of losing his mom. I mean, how can you hate this kid? Look at him. And take this fact with a grain of salt, but it is said that in this scene of Ben first meeting Sersha, in the final cut, he says nothing and looks at her with disdain. But initially, he was supposed to say... I hate you. That would have been his first words to her, and I think that would have made a bigger impact on the scene. Because after the memories, we cut to Ben bawling his eyes out. It would have given a more emotional hit for Ben to see himself treating Sersha that way, and regretting now that he realizes he does care for her, and is troubled by the fact that she might stay a stone forever. He meets Maka, who's just a sweet little old lady right here. I feel like this scene was inspired by Spirited Away, where Chihiro meets the witch Zeniba, where she is said to be dangerous and scary, and was actually quite sweet and kind. I don't feel it's too far-fetched since Tomar did say he took inspiration from Miyazaki's films, but we'll talk more about that later. Maka turns people into stone because she claims that 
she's trying to help them by turning them to stone. She's taking all the bad emotions and experiences away like she did to her son in the legend who had his heart broken. If you're looking at the witch right now, you might be connecting the dots in your head. She looks a hell of a lot like Grandmama Mommy Mama, doesn't she? Huh. Odd, that might not be important in the whole grand scheme of things of the theme and plot. Anyway, with all of Saoirse's strength, she blows on the horn, letting out all the emotions Maka felt that she thought was bad. She then helps them get back home where they meet dear old dad who's still as dismissive to Ben as ever. Classic Connor, am I right? Ben being the Chad that he is, jumps into the sea because his dad was being stubborn and gets the coat with the help of the sea lions. And Saoirse's first word is her brother's name. Aww. Saoirse's so weakened that she's not getting better with the coat, so Ben helps her sing her song and she does she also floats you know normal baby stuff this sets every fairy turned to stone free as well as maka's son then we see an older seal <laughs> you know what that means time to confront everybody's source of grief yay but ben calls out waking bronog opening her eyes to see ben and connor asking for sersha to stay but of course it's not them to decide it's sersha um i want to stay Alrighty then. Bronog takes Saoirse's coat so that her world and the human world will get untangled. She gives a goodbye kiss to Connor and says how much she loves Ben, and then Thanos snaps herself away. Grandmama Mummy Mama Mama finds them and Connor reassures her that they're alright now. And I don't know if it was Connor's somewhat more content aura or motherly instinct, but she seems to believe him and is relieved. Then we cut to Ben's birthday where they're celebrating it on the shore. Whether that be because it is Ben's favorite place to hang out to, or if they want to feel like Bronog can somewhat be part of the celebration by holding it in a place where they feel is largely connected to her. I don't know, but it's a nice contrast to Saoirse's birthday where they held it at night, confined in the house, confined in their own little troubles. We get a call back to when Ben did this, but this time it's Saoirse doing it and no hard feelings and just laughing it off. Then for the last scene, it's Ben and Saoirse swimming in the sea. This might be a little tidbit of the siblings finally getting along, but I'd also like to think it's showing how Ben has remembered fondly of his mother and has come to terms with her gone now, since at the start he was terrified to go into the water, but now it's him being embraced by the water around him. And I don't know about you, but it takes a hell of a lot of security and peace of mind to swim in the ocean and get engulfed around just a massive body of water. And I think that's what they're trying to show in this last scene with the two happily playing underwater. Now that that's out of the way, I'd like to talk about my thoughts on the story of the movie. Song of the Sea story is about a kid going on an adventure to save his sister, learn to get along, and find more about his mother. But more importantly, it's a story about emotional repression and the harm that comes with it and those around you. In an article by Patrick Cross entitled A Wave of Emotion. He points out how each character has their own emotional or physical issues that they are trying to or are being repressed. Take Connor, the most obvious example, who barely interacts with his children and seems to be contemplating and thinking about his late wife, which is weighing down heavily on him on Saoirse's birthday, which is also Bronog's death anniversary. You're better off not thinking about that night, you know. Her anniversary is just once a year, Mom. Another example is Sersha, who needs her coat in order to speak, being repressed vocally and spiritually until she gets the coat that sets her free. And if you didn't catch that, they literally put characters in Ben's story that are a direct reflection to Connor and his mother, Maka and her son. Maka literally sucks any extreme emotion she feels in a bottle, slowly turning her into stone and turning her son into stone so that he wouldn't feel the grief of his heartbreak. Patrick Crossan also mentioned Ben being the only one not repressing his emotions and expressing it, being a kid. But I digress. I can definitely see Ben being the only vocal character to express emotions and even rejecting Maka's offer to take all the sadness away. But Ben also has been repressing his emotions and mostly because he skips right away from sulking and back into taking action and resolving his feelings. He's frustrated that he was taken away from his home. He cries and then bottles it up and then immediately starts a plan to get back home. The takeaway for Song of the Sea based on what Patrick says is to accept these emotions, the good and the bad. Teach kids to accept these emotions as a fact of life and unapologetically be kids. I like that lesson a lot. It's an important lesson both children and parents need to learn or be reminded of. The movie, if you watch it yourself, can feel slow. This film has a lot of breather moments, and I mean a lot. Some good, some not so much, and it's not usual for movies to have these kinds of slow pacing and breather moments, except for one studio. Ghibli. It reminded me of Ghibli studio movies and in an interview with Tom Moore conducted by Dan Sarto, he asked if Tom looked to filmmakers like Hayao Miyazaki who isn't afraid to step up their story arcs and characters. Tom replied with, When we look at films like My Neighbor Totoro, we looked at the fact that Miyazaki slowed things down but was still charming. He took time to look around and focus on a raindrop, 
or a leaf. As much as the action going on in the scene, he was really inspiring. Animating is quite meditative, and it's nice to reflect that quality in a film, the pacing, the tone, or quietness. End quote. It was apparent that they wanted to capture that calming, serene feeling everybody feels when watching a Ghibli film. And I totally felt that, especially at the scene where Ben and Saoirse stop by a holy well. It doesn't give the same vibes as Ghibli, but I don't think it's fair to compare the two, especially since Cartoon Saloon is a independent animation studio, working on a limited budget, and has a more storybook-type aesthetic. This is the last part dwelling on his interview, but I do appreciate this sentiment he shared, which is a really good mindset to make a unique movie. Tom is taking risks, and it brings a unique touch to his creation. You know he's aware of the limitations, and as much as Cartoon Saloon wants to push past those limits, they try to go about it in a more practical way. Suffice it to say, madiskarte sila. Dan Sarta asked him, Is it riskier as an independent animated feature film director to tell more subtle and gentle myth-based stories than the more action-adventure stories most big studio directors tell these days? He replies with nothing but the facts, the cold hard mother frickin' truth! Yeah. It is. But the reason I make these types of films is that I want to take those types of risks as an alternative to making films where every 10 seconds you need another gag. Even though it's riskier, it's worth it for me to make a film like Song of the Sea. It's more challenging, that's for sure. You're working on a shoestring budget, but because of that, you can afford to take those types of risks. A lot of my friends who work at the big studios and get to play on the big playgrounds at places like Pixar and DreamWorks are jealous of the risk we take. We owe it to ourselves to make films that are really different as often as we can. We're constantly being assaulted by noisy, faster, brighter, and more exciting imagery. It's like we have a sneaky advantage by offering something that's an antidote to that. If you didn't like the pacing of Song of the Sea, it's totally alright. We have a variety of movies for everyone to enjoy. What Tom said about exciting and action-packed movies isn't a diss to the genre. He's just stating the facts that most of the kind of movies we're exposed to are like that, and he's presenting another type of way of telling a story that brings a little bit of a balance, a calmer side to things with a lot of breathing moments. I have to mention though, even though it's not as breathtaking as Ghibli shots, it does have a somewhat similar effect. He did mention he wanted to capture the feeling, and you know what? He kinda did. All in all, the story is great. I don't usually research this much for movies because I try to share my thoughts on it without being swayed or changed by reading other people's opinions about it, but after finishing Song of the Sea, I felt a sense of wanting more. Not in the sense of it being a cliffhanger, but just wanted to see more of how Ben and Saoirse are living life. I felt like there was more to the movie than I initially thought at first, so I dug through it and found all the things I told you about in this video, and honestly learned more about the behind the scenes of the movie. The deleted scenes, the themes, the intentions, and the process of it. It really made me appreciate the movie so much more. I've read about how long the movie took to make or the different animation styles they use for the film, but if I explain all of that in this video, I feel like the length would have doubled than it already is now. Now let's talk about the characters. Firstly, let's talk about a minor character. I like to talk about Bronog, Ben's mom. Though she has little screen time and played a very minor role in the movie, she had a big impact on the characters and their motivations throughout the movie. She was voiced by the wonderful Lisa Hannigan, who you might be familiar with as the voice of Blue Diamond from Steven Universe. I can never get enough of her soft, soothing way of talking, so hearing her in this movie is just a treat. Bronog is such a minor character, but she's so mysterious that I keep wondering what kind of person she was throughout the movie. She's just a character followed by questions. She was the character I was most fascinated to learn more about, not only because of her magical side, but also how much her presence affected not only her family, but the whole grand scheme of the human and magical world. They didn't give much detail about her, but I still like the feeling of hoping and waiting for a teeny bit of info I can scrap about her, like what her personality was or what Selkies are, though that just might be me not being too familiar with what Selkies are in Irish folklore. I was confused if she died or if she was just a seal the whole time, and after looking and looking through the internet, I couldn't find a concrete answer. Some say she turned to the spirit world as her true self, a Selkie, and was just a assumed dead or missing by her family. Some say she actually died. I'm leaning more on the latter. Then let's move on to the husband. Connor was first shown as a loving dad that is caring and affectionate, but as the movie cuts to his wife's death anniversary and Saoirse's birthday, you can see how tired he looks, how much the day is weighing on his mind. I was a bit harsh on Connor while doing the recap, but I do understand that it must be hard to celebrate one's birth, all the while being reminded of the love of his life disappearing. I'm glad he never once made Saoirse feel that it was her fault or taking it out on her, but then again, 
Ben sometimes takes the brunt of his anger, whether it be about the frustrations about the situation or his mental situation or not. Most of his interactions with Ben were a bit neglectful and a bit aggressive. I would have loved it if Connor and Ben had a little heart to heart by the end of the movie and then talking about how Connor was hard on Ben or how Ben realizing that his actions somewhat made it harder for his dad, which he didn't mean to do. Unfortunately, I didn't get that closure between these two. At the end of the day, Connor was just a guy trying to deal with the complicated feelings he has, all the while dealing with two kids on his own. I'd like to cut him some slack since he seemed to have changed for the better by the end. Doesn't excuse how he treated Ben, but I can understand why. For the next characters, I kind of want to talk about their grandma and Maka at the same time because both mother and son were a mirror of each other. The little tidbit of characterization we didn't see from grandma can be seen in Maka, where she bottles up her emotion as well as try that method with her sons, thinking that they know best and having good intentions in the worst executions. I do like the idea of bottling up your emotions and repressing them is the same as turning into stone, because not only does the stone represent not ever feeling the emotions you chose to repress, but it also hinders you from feeling anything at all. The sadness may be gone, but being turned to stone or repressing your emotions and not accepting them is closing off any chance of feeling other emotions like excitement, pity, happiness. Maka is guilty of that, no questions. Grandma, on the other hand, we only see it happen once. It was when Connor was going to the pub and she tells him that he should stop thinking about that day. But Connor retorts that the death anniversary only comes once a year. But with how Grandma Mami Ma spoke, it feels like Connor always thinks about it and not just because it's her anniversary. Also, she keeps saying she knows best, so pretty obvious reflection of the two characters there. Then we see Sersha who is the daughter of Bronog and is half human, half Selkie. She was destined to free the fairies like her mother was supposed to and Connor hid her code because apparently in Irish folklore, correct me if I'm wrong, the code of the Selkie must be hidden to them because if they find it, they will be compelled to go back to the sea. That's why as soon as she found the code, she kept coming back and started to get weaker without it. This also implies that Connor knew Bronog and Cersei are Selkie, especially since when Connor was putting it away, he says, I can't lose her too, Bronog, and just drops it into the sea. Sersha is sweet though. Even if the main character we know is annoyed by her and by proxy, the audience would end up having the same opinions as Ben. We don't. Sersha is sweet and adorable, and even if her brother is mean to her, she cares for him. It does make sense that Sersha decided to stay with Ben and Connor because all of her life, she didn't really know Bronog. If Ben was in her shoes, you bet your expired champarada that he'll take his coat and fly off to Tirna Og in a heartbeat. Sersha didn't really have a character arc aside from her magical discovery, so let's talk about the character that I've been dying to discuss. Ben is my favorite character, not only because he's the main character, whose eyes and experience we get to see, whose opinions and perspective we get influenced through throughout the movie, but mainly because he doesn't really get a win or gets his way. Yeah, I mean, everybody lost Bronog, but Sersha never met her ever. Connor's a bit pitiful yeah, but the fact that he hasn't moved on is hindering him from being a caring and loving dad he once was. Ben turned into a brat, but as a kid, losing your mom is very impactful to his upbringing, and he's not done growing and learning about how to deal with his emotions, and the people around him aren't a very good example of it either. Adding to the fact that he has to look after Sersha and gets dragged into how protective everybody is of her whenever she does something reckless, and by reckless I mean something completely natural to her, like going to the sea. But in everyone's eyes, it's dangerous. Ben is just a kid. You gotta understand that. He's a kid who needs love and attention and learns not to repress his emotions like what the adults around him are doing. This movie is calm, but at least they know how to instill a sense of urgency to us. And since they're kids, the small reader moments make sense, like the one in the holy well, because they're small and itty bitty tiny children who get tired and sometimes don't know what to do. I like it. It also makes me feel bad that Ben always calls out to and asks his dad for help. By the end of the movie, after he got Cersei's coat back, he smiles and says to his dad, she's a selkie. Like mom, isn't she? He didn't question or get mad at Connor for hiding that fact or not listening earlier. He's just relieved that Sersha is safe and they're with their dad again. And when Ben first spots the adult sea lion, he says, Dad, look. These are really, really small details I can't help but notice because I probably wouldn't have spoken to him at all after how he treated him if I were Ben. But Ben keeps involving his dad in the things he does, which makes me realize that Connor probably was good to Ben, but the only time we get to see them interact was at the very day Connor had a lot on his mind. I don't know, that's just a little thing that kind of caught me by surprise. I may be wrong though. In the end, Song of the Sea is a really creative film that really had heart and a great cast. The music is fantastic and resonates with you even after the film. So do I recommend you to watch it? It's
it's not for everybody, but I do recommend it. Who knows? You might like it. Ben didn't like Sersha at first, but now they're close besties. Earlier, this was a movie review, but now it's not. Because we're going to talk about the sponsors. Tokyo Treat and Sakura Co. invites everybody to experience Japan from the comfort of your own home through these unique snack boxes. Tokyo Treats is a monthly pop Japanese snack subscription with the latest and limited edition snacks that you can only find in Japan. Sakura Co. is a monthly authentic Japanese snack box supporting local Japanese snack makers with traditional and authentic Japanese snacks and tea and even comes with a special Japanese tableware. Once you get these boxes, there are booklets containing common allergens and ingredients to know what you're getting in each box. And yes, there are pictures in it. This month, Tokyo Treats' theme is Snack and New Year's, where they have snacks and a drink called Fanta Premier, which tastes like Soju Plus C2, aka my favorite drink, without the alcohol, of course. They also have Spy Family Anya Candy, and I bet you're curious what it tastes like, and it actually tastes like orphans. Kidding. It has a sweet and sour candy flavor. Too sour for my taste, though. Sakurako's theme is New Year's in Niigata. They collaborated with Niigata Prefecture, which is renowned for high-quality rice products like sake and mochi. I instantly took a bite of their fortune cookie, hoping I can get that RNG luck for my Genshin pulls. I took a bite, and I was a little bit scared that I swallowed the paper because I saw no paper inside. But I cracked it more and found that the paper said, Ho ho! I can't understand Japanese! After asking a friend, I actually got great luck, if they're not lying to me. They also have these Snow Rabbit Soft Chew, which are absolutely adorable and squishy and soft, and I just like marshmallows a lot. For the tableware, they gave the Sakurako Sake Cup. Ain't it cute? I was told to drink it with the tea that came along with the box, but I couldn't heat up water at the time of the recording, so I drank the Fanta Soda with it. Great cup, I'll give it an A. Treat yourself with these boxes, or get them as a gift. If you watched at this point, then you're in for a treat. Sakurako has a free Ticket to Japan giveaway that ends on January 31st. If you want to fulfill your weeaboo dreams, now is the time to get these boxes. Don't forget to use my code ROSMO to get $5 off of your first box and get the chance to experience Japan in person. Thanks a bunch Tokyo Treat and Sakurako for sponsoring this video. So yeah, greeting a happy new year to my awesome patrons, especially the ones in the butternut and dill pickles tier. Cross, Christian V, Kyle, Jacob K, F Ignite, and Piranette. Speaking of Piranette, I've opened movie requests on my Patreon and the next review is La Maison, uh, was it right? Or The House, as they requested. 